Hi, I'm Kimberly Ray Clement, and I am here to talk about the, the gospel with you today, the grand narrative. Now, I chose to use artwork as a creative way to share the gospel today because art is a language that transcends barriers, okay? Everyone can look at a picture and see a story involved. Now, I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and God created the heavens and earth. God had a pretty busy six days. He went from nothing. He went from the one I am, only God, to everything in six days. If you think about that, that's astounding. The heavens, the earth, the waters, the dry land, the vegetation, the animals, and finally, man, on day six. On day six, God created Adam. And he created Adam to be the caretaker of earth. He created, animal, he created Adam to take care of all the animals of earth, okay? But he realized that Adam was going to need a helpmate. So he put Adam to sleep, removed one of his ribs, and from that rib created Eve. Now they had an amazing relationship with God in Eden. They had the type of relationship that oh, God wants for every one of us to have with him. There was no hidden secrets. Everything was open, everything was honest, it was intimate. God walked in the gardens with them. And then the serpent showed up. Now we don't know where the serpent came from. Genesis doesn't tell us. Revelation indicates that the serpent was Satan. So the serpent tempted Eve and he used her vulnerabilities. He used, he twisted God's words. Satan's great at that, isn't he? He twisted God's word to think, you know what? God's not protecting you from something. He doesn't want you to be as smart as him. So Eve succumbed to temptation and the apple represents the fruit. So she took the fruit to Adam, he ate it as well. And then of course they realized that they were naked and that nakedness was sin. So as God came through the garden calling from them, they hid from God. And unfortunately what had to happen as a result of that was the first blood sacrifice for sin. God actually had to kill an animal, skin that animal and provide clothing for Adam and Eve. I can't imagine for them from having gone from the relationship that they had with the animals to knowing that one had to be sacrificed to cover their sin. At that point, they had also to be removed from the garden because God could no longer have them enjoying the tree of life either. We don't want to live forever with sin on our hearts and between us and God. So they were, they had the fall and they were expelled from Eden. Now we know from that point on, sin continued, unfortunately. We've heard the stories, we know about Cain and Abel. They also had a son, Seth, among other daughters. And of Seth's line came Noah. Well, unfortunately, gosh, sin continued. Man didn't learn anything. Um, being the barrier of sin between God, being banned from Eden, Man still continued to sin. And I can't, I can't imagine how bad it was for God to make the decision in his heart to destroy his creation because God loves man so much. And yet there was a part of God that even though his heart was absolutely broken, he still wanted to give man a chance. So he gathered Noah and his family and he told them, build the ark, bring the animals, two by two, seven by seven, bring food. Take the animals. I'm going to destroy the earth. So Noah and his family did what they were instructed to do. And God kept his word. The springs of the earth opened. The rain started to fall. And the earth was, was covered. Life was destroyed. They were on the ark for over a year. At that point, the water started to recede a little bit. And the ravens went out. And they flew around and around until the earth dried. Noah let a dove out. The dove came back. A few days later, Noah let a dove out again. This time, the dove came back with an olive branch in their mouth, which told Noah that the waters were in fact receding and there was going to be vegetation and food as well. A few days later, he sent the dove out again, and this time the dove did not return. So over time, the waters receded and they were able to come back out of the ark. Now, you would have thought that man would have learned at that point, right? We've been booted out of Eden, right? God created, destroyed his creation where all that's left, but sin still occurred. In fact, one of the interesting things that we're learning about the Old Testament was how did God communicate with us, okay? We didn't have Christ yet. 
How did God communicate? Well, God communicated through the prophets, Elijah, Isaiah. And prophets had two jobs. They prophesied things that were coming in the future, like the birth of Jesus being born of a virgin. And they also gave warnings and passed judgments that God was going to give warning kings and the common man that if you didn't get your stuff together, this is what God was going to do. Now we move a little bit forward. I'm sorry I'm moving so fast on these pictures, but I have a limited amount of time and there's so much information that I want to share. Now we come to the time of Christ, okay? <clears throat> now, the question about Christ, people ask, well, how, how is it three things? How can God be three things? You have God, you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Son of God. But you all say, it's God. Well, it is. Genesis said from the very beginning that the Spirit of God was over the waters. Okay? So already back in Genesis, we know that there was God and then the Holy Spirit of God. Well, back to communication. And how did God communicate with us? Well, personally, if God wants to talk to me, it's typically done through my Bible when I'm studying or in a sermon if I start squirming in the pew. Okay? Moses was the burning bush. Well, if God came to me with a burning bush, I would think I was having a psychotic break. So just like the average man of the times, God wanted to communicate in a way that they would relate to and they would understand. So God came down himself in the form of man because God knew that man can relate to man. He also knew that there had to be a price to be paid for our sin. And that price was going to be paid in full by Christ. Now, we don't know much about Christ's childhood. We do know he spent time in the synagogue studying. So this is <coughs> Make Way, and this depicts Christ's baptism, okay? And so he had a cousin, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was at the River Jordan baptizing. And John the Baptist in this oil is depicted as a camel. And you think, why on earth is John the Baptist depicted as a camel? Well, because scripture tells us that John the Baptist was wrapped in camel hair and leather, hence the camel hair and then we have leather. Another interesting thing about John the Baptist is he had his foot both in the Old and the New Testament. So when you see the camel hair, you see half the camel is in the past and half is in the future. Now John was baptizing. So you see the representation of baptism, the spring of the living water, and you see a tree, but under this tree is something interesting. Under this tree, there are broken chains. Now, as you know, okay, sin is our, sin chains us, okay? Sin enslaves us. And so baptizing through the living water helps break the chains of sin. So when Christ was baptized, a few things happened. When he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit went up in flames. And the voice of God came down saying, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. After his baptism, he went up and he underwent the temptation with Satan. And he went three, through three temptations. I don't have the time to get into them, but they are depicted here. What I am going to point out to you is the depiction of Satan as the snake slithering away in defeat because we know that Christ was triumphant. Now, after this, the life of Christ, we know that Christ performed miracles. We know about Lazarus, okay? We know about the blind man that he made see. We know about the child. But one of my favorite miracles that you don't hear a lot about was the woman that touched Christ's robe. That's what she did. She just touched his robe, and she was healed. She had spent 12 years hemorrhaging, and she touched his robe. And he said, who touched my robe? And of course, immediately she's prostrate because she thinks she did something wrong or she's gonna get in trouble. And he blesses her. And he blesses her because she had the faith. She, had, she knew he was God. She knew that she would be healed simply by touching his robe. And so that's one of my favorites, to have that kind of faith. So now I'm gonna introduce you to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane has all kinds of different items in here depicted. It covers the Last Supper, it covers the betrayal, it covers the, the crucifixion, it covers Judas and Judas hanging himself. And the best part, it covers the resurrection. You have the oil, the bread, the nails, you have the thorns for the crown. You have the rooster that depicts the rooster crows three times and he was denied three times. You have the rabbits 
that are the apostles asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, even the three favorite apostles. And you have the Lamb of God alone. Then you have Judas with his pouch of gold. You have the Roman soldiers, and you have the plaza in which he was denied. You see where Judas hung himself, and then you see here the cross. You see the cross where he was crucified. You see the two crosses of the criminals. But this shows hope because you also see the empty tomb. Christ died for our sins, but he is alive. He ascended into heaven. He sits on the right hand of the Father with the promise that he is coming back for us. He will return. He will return in glory through the through the clouds, accompanied by angels, and we will see him. We know he will accompany and take us back. We know that he is now the king of kings, and we have been reunited with our father because he died for our sins.